everyone, and welcome to today's Surge webinar in partnership with WeCoach and hosted by Dr. Jen Fry. Today's webinar is titled Empowering Female Athletes, How to Help Prepare Female Athletes on Boundary Setting, Navigating Conflict, and Advocating for Self. We are going to watch a short video on Surge before I pass it off to WeCoach for some introductions. As a Surge member, you'll unlock access to resources that build confidence, motivation, and mental well-being to empower girls to stay in the game today and pave the way for their future success. Up your game with free professional development and curriculum resources for coaches and athletes. Foster community and connection with VIP access to girls' sporting events, coaching forums, giveaways, and workshops hosted by industry-leading partners. Make waves with exclusive Surge branding packages, designs, and apparel. Recognize and celebrate with special awards like Team of the Season and Athlete of the Season to uplift and honor your female athletes. Unlock exclusive offers, including new product sneak peeks, promos, and member-only Surge stores. Fresh content designed to empower female athletes will be added to the platform every month. So together, we can help power girls forward. That is awesome. Love that video. Hello, everybody. My name is Marcy Cornegy. I'm the leadership uh, programs and events director with We Coach, and if this is the first time that you have heard of We Coach or know anything about We Coach, we are a nonprofit membership organization. We're dedicated to recruiting, advancing, and retaining women coaches in all sports and levels, and we do that through year-round professional growth and leadership development programs and special collaborations, just like this with Surge. And BSN Sports. We offer individual and group memberships, which can all be found on our website at wecoachsports.org. And also through our programs and events, I'm going to drop in the chat box where you can go and check out some of our upcoming events. Uh, we appreciate this collaboration and the vision from BSN Sports to have Surge and the opportunity to partner with them to help power girls and women forward and bring critical topics like the topics you're going to have today with Dr. Fry directly to you. Um, our next collaboration actually will be January 22nd uh, at the same time with Betsy Butterick. Uh, but without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Jen Fry. And Jen, Fry is no stranger to our We Coach community. She's a graduate of the very first class of the Women Coaches Academy. And that's 21 years ago. You do the math. I'm not going to say a word. Don't come Marcy. Here. Hey, friend, that means that you know things. And we're uh, excited about listening to what you have to say today. Um, but that was 21 years ago, back when they stayed in dorm rooms and ate cafeteria food. And uh, on this Friday, if we have any collegiate coaches in this space, we will be dropping applications for the 54th class. Uh, so there have been 54 classes since you, Jen Fry. Um, you are a trusted friend to We Coach and a member benefit partner, and you've served on academy faculty for years, including our youth and high school coaches academy, countless panels, and it's... Uh, you know, it's 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 good to be able to call you friend and have you a friend of our organization to your tremendous ambassador for the work we do. And we certainly appreciate you. Um, she's going to tell a little bit about what she does, her background in sport and coaching, uh, her entrepreneurial ventures. But I want to take two more seconds to provide just a few short trip, uh, like tricks, tips on how to get the absolute most out of this session. Um, I've heard Jen speak many, many times. So you need to stop what you do. I'm going to be super blunt. You need to stop what it is you're doing. You need to be completely 100% locked in because she's going to drop nuggets that are going to blow your mind that you already think you might know, but you don't really know, but you need to know because you need to move forward on it and take action. So pay attention. You don't want to miss every other word. Be all in. Uh, she's going to engage with you. She's going to have that conversation. She's going to have some thoughtful activities or invite you to speak. So take advantage of that opportunity. Um, be ready to receive feedback um, and ask the hard questions. She's going to give you the hard answers. And we are also going to be giving away some engagement gifts. So it, it, it's going to pay off to engage as much as you can. With that, I'm going to completely turn it over to you. 
Thank you. I appreciate you, Marcy. You're the homie. I thank you. Oh, you're on, you're on mute, Zach. Thank you. I haven't made that mistake in a minute, but um, thank you so much, Marcy, and everyone for joining us today. Um, my name is Saxton Miller, and I work here at BSN Sports on the Surge team, so get to work with a lot of awesome women, um, people every day. So, Dr. Jen Fry, why don't we go ahead and get right into it? To start us off, could you share a bit about yourself and your background? Absolutely. First, I just want to say thank you to We Coach. Uh, literally, even though Marcy said how long I've been involved, it's been 21 years. I was in the very first um, cohort. And the thing I will tell anyone who's listening on here, just apply this stuff. You never know if you'll get in. I was the baby of the group and I just applied and got in. So if there's things you want to do, please just apply because you never know how it will affect you in 21 years. So apply to everything possible. We Coach is a phenomenal organization. If you are a coach, please apply. Um, to the cohorts because you will learn not only so much information but you will gain a amazing group of trusted friends and that's the key thing is we coach the network the alumni is wonderful so you have to apply to that so to kind of give you an idea of who i am is i come from college athletics i was a college volleyball coach for about 15 years i coached all over the world i coached at norfolk state i coached at washington state i coached at Illinois, we play for a national championship. If there's anyone from UCLA, I don't like you because we lost you. So if you're on the call and you're from UCLA, I'm, I'm going to hunt you down. Just going to say that. I'm going to hunt you down like an animal. Um, so at, when I was at Elon is where I started to see the space between race and sport. And I thought that we were not giving our coaches, our athletes, the skills that they needed. We tend in conferences to do a lot of X's and O's and strategy and stuff of that nature and not a lot of the holistic aspect. And I thought that that was really needed because I come from being a coach and I think about the skills I was supremely lacking that I wish I had at that age. I was 27 and I, there were so many skills, human skills I didn't have that I wish that I did have. And that's why I decided to be a speaker. And then um, I went to Michigan State and got my PhD in sports geography. I'm probably one of the only sport geographers in the world. And then in 2022, when I finished my PhD, I was like, why not start a tech company? Of course. So I decided to start a tech company uh, called Cordal, and we help with group movement. So if you think about whenever you do team travel or tournament travel, usually it's text message, email, a lot of chaos. We put it all into one app. It's easy, accessible, one source of truth. Very cool. And I know you also have a passion for working in the conflict space. Um, yeah. Been, many people try to steer you away from that. So re what really sparked your passion um, to get into that field? In fact, also, let me shout out BSM Surge. Amazing footage, amazing what y'all do. Sex. I'm so excited to have this conversation with you. Um, so I would probably say what really prompted me to get into the conflict space is I realized it's a space that coaches and athletes are, when I tell you ill-equipped, completely ill-equipped to work in. And it is affecting the daily life of coaches, the daily life of athletes. I think about how many problems coaches from youth sports, college sports, club sports, AAU are having problems with parents. There are just the lack of communication, which is then causing conflict. Our athletes don't know how to advocate for themselves. The coaches don't know how to handle athletes advocating for themselves. So it's consistent, really budding heads. And I thought that this was a space that athletics needed to transform in because athletics is really at the forefront of society. Think about how much stuff athletics leads with. Clothing, music, moves, whatever it is. And so why can't we be at the forefront of how do we teach conflict skills to coaches, administrations for them to role model, but also to the young people that we're helping develop so that they can understand how to fiercely self-advocate, how to have a voice, how to set boundaries, how to say no, because as we're helping them grow as humans, when they go from you know younger sports, high school to college, they have got to understand how to self-advocate for themselves. They've got to understand how to have those really tough conversations without the parent consistently leading the way. They have to. And right now they, they don't. And it ends up ruining not only their experience, but the coach's experience because no one wants to have those conversations because they just don't have the skills. That's awesome. And there are so many important parts of these athletes' lives that I never really touched on. And yeah. I see that there's many difficulties with being in that space, but what are some of the most rewarding aspects of being in this space and working with these athletes and coaches? 
when I talk to coaches who are like, I just have never, like, I never thought of how to have these conversations. And while it was scary and hard, I still had the conversation, right? Like I was ill-equipped to go tell my AD or my boss, these are the things we needed, or these are the problems I had, but at least I understand the hardness of the situation and I'm willing to do it. I think a lot of people, when they talk about conflict, sometimes they think of conflict like big C conflict, like verbal altercations and fights versus thinking about small C conflict, which is just advocating for themselves or You know, I mean, how many times do volleyball coaches have to have arguments about court space when when basketball starts? How to advocate for yourself to say, no, we still are in season. We're about to go to postseason. This is our court. And so really the kind of understanding that they're like, I know how to advocate for myself. Also, I think what I love about this is when I see um, athletes who come up to me and they're like, I am going to therapy. I'm only dating people that are going to therapy because then we can have these conversations on the same plank, right? I'm able to advocate for myself. I am going home for Thanksgiving and I have an idea of what I'm gonna say to my parents, even though it's gonna be hard. I am rethinking how I communicate during conflict in relationships. So all that stuff I love because conflict is a mental health issue. The better you are at conflict, the better your mental health is. Because think about whenever you have a conflict, like a small, even a small C conflict with someone, how you ruminate in your head over and over and over again about it. And so for me, it's giving them the help that they maybe didn't realize they needed, but is really changing their life. That's great. And why is it particularly important for female athletes to learn about setting boundaries and handling this, this conflict in their life? Oh my gosh, because I've seen so many female athletes put themselves in really bad positions because they're afraid of conflict. They've been in locations that are dangerous, They have been in dangerous places related to their body being touched. They've been in just such bad places because they're afraid to say no. They don't want to hurt someone's feelings. They don't want to make their friends mad. I mean, anyone in the chat, you can probably think about it. The last time you were talking to one of your athletes who made a bad decision, you're like, but you knew it was a bad decision, like where you were at and what was going on. And they're like, yeah, but I just didn't want to make my friend mad. I, I just didn't want Marcy to be upset with me. And it's like, but you knew it was a, like, it was a harmful thing. I know. And so it's that aspect of they need to understand it's okay to make people upset. It's okay to say no. It's okay to leave. It's okay to put yourself first. And I want more women to understand that, especially at younger ages, because if we can teach them at the younger ages to fiercely advocate for themselves, we're going to make some badass females. And we have to understand that, is that we have to get used to how they self-advocate and to teach them how to do that, because we don't come out of a womb knowing how to really self-advocate for self. And so sometimes it can look a little ugly when they're doing it. They might get a little angrier. They might have some tears. And how do we help them navigate that so that when it comes time to really do it, when maybe they are in college and they have to advocate for their grade or their boss, they have to advocate for higher pay. They have at least built the skill. And we have to remember that us as coaches are kind of their self-advocacy guinea pigs because they have to learn how to do it. And if we're teaching them how to be holistic humans, we have to be able to take that on because I think sometimes coaches don't like it when athletes say no or question them. But if we're going to teach them how to advocate, they have to learn how to ask questions They have to learn how to ask good questions and stand up for themselves. And that's why it's a two-way street with coaches and athletes. Athletes have to understand how to self-advocate and coaches have to teach athletes how to advocate, but also coaches have to teach themselves how to emotionally regulate when coaches are learning how to, to, when, when athletes are learning how to advocate or set boundaries. Because us as coaches, right, it's kind of like when you, you have a kid, you want your kid to say no to everyone except for you, right? We want our athletes to say, to advocate for themselves fiercely except to us. And we have to understand that part of the the training of self-advocacy is they're using us as a guinea pig to figure out what the words are, how does it feel, like what do I do, what do I say? They have to learn how to do that. And just like they're learning their skill of throwing, catching, hitting, they have to learn this skill as well. I love that. And I love how you talked about, you know, saying no. And, you know, you hear a lot of a lot of young females describe themselves as being a people pleaser or yes. putting a lot on their plate because they don't say yes. no. 
So why in today's society, especially, and with everything going on, why is it so hard for women, especially to say no and stand up for themselves in that way? Are there different so can, vital aspects that weigh on uh, them more? That is such a beautiful question. And also, if y'all are listening and you have any questions, throw them in the chat right now. If it's something that we can feed into the chat, I, I'll stop and we'll talk about it or we can end it. But I really want to make sure that you are leaving not having a question. So you can message me, DM it, whatever it is. But please, please use this time to ask questions. Oh my God, that's such a good question. I will tell you this. I am a, I, I tell people not to waste their peer pressure on me. I say, don't waste your peer pressure on me. I'm a, because I'm not going to do it. Like when I say no, baby, you can go talk to that wall. Because I, like to me, I, waste your peer pressure. Go, go, go try and do that to someone else. But also I'm 44 and I've had to build that up. Because many times you don't want to hurt people's feelings and, and people grow up seeing people pleasers, right? It's not like you just pop out of the womb and you're a people pleaser. You see your family members role model people pleasing all the time, putting themselves uh, behind every single person. But like there's this Instagram post from years ago and it was like, I hope that when I pass away, no one ever talks about how I put them in front of me. Like, I hope that they never do that. That like Jen put everyone else in front of her. I hope no one ever says that. Never, ever, ever. Because I don't, I want that to be the furthest from the truth. Because when you consistently put people in front of you, you are living with such resentment all the time, hot resentment all the time. You're mad all the time. And the problem is, I think society has this expectation that women always say yes that women always put everyone in front of themselves. Their kids have to be in front of themselves, always. I think about whenever um, a mom misses a tournament to go on a girls weekend, how could you miss your kid's tournament? I just, to go, to go for yourself? And it's like this huge no-no that you're expected to be at every practice, every tournament, everything for everyone else. And I think it's this aspect that women are expected to carry the load no matter what. And I'm all about like, mom, go miss that tournament. Your kid will be okay. My mom probably went to, I don't know, half of my tournaments because she was a working mom. I think I turned out fine. I don't have any warrants out for my arrest that I know about, but I think I'm okay, right? And I think parents in these day and age have the idea that if I'm not at every single event possible, I'm going to cause my kid horrible trauma and therapy. And that is completely farthest from the truth. What helps a kid not be traumatized is a healthy mom. That is what keeps a kid with their head on their shoulders, doing great in school, having healthy relationships, is their mom being really, really healthy for themselves. And so I think that's just in society how we're taught, because what it is, is that when you say no to those societal pressures, you're deemed to be a bad woman. And that's the thing that people have to get over is being like, oh my God, you're not going to go do this. No. Are you sure? Yes. I'm hundred percent sure. Like I think about when my ex, um, he was supposed to get like a hotel room for a wedding and he didn't. And I was like, I'm not going if you're not getting the, getting the hotel room. And one of my friends was like, well, what if he's upset? You're not going. And I'm like, then that's his fault. Like he should have done his job. And so it, it is hard. I will never say it's not hard to buck against society. And once you realize that you are the most important person in this situation, because the healthier you are, the healthier other people are going to be around you, you start to be okay with people being like, you're going to be missing that tournament. Yes, I am. And I'll have a drink for you, right? Because that's how you're healthy is that you learn to set those boundaries and say no, because the earlier you can do it, the easier it gets. When you've allowed someone to do stuff for a long time and then you set the boundary, that's when there's a lot of problems because they're not used to the boundary. But once you set it and you're like, hey, I'm setting this, they might bump up against it a few times, but then they fall back. Awesome. And mom shamers are real. Like you think it's just the yes. kids you have to go through, you know, yes. the pressures from their peers, but you don't realize like your parents are also facing some of the pressures too. And those are just getting modeled back to the mm, Yeah. So it's a vicious cycle. Um, yep. We actually got, um, I know you followed up on that, but so we can wait for a response on the yep. We'll keep an eye That'd on that That'd be perfect. One. Yeah. Um, but why are setting boundaries so hard, both on and off the field? Like, is it only because of peers will look down or are there tools to help kind of set those boundaries in advance? Because um, I just feel like it's a, it's a very recurring issue and people, you know, don't respect the boundaries initially. And then, you know, you might feel like you've just 
kind of let your guards down now. You feel like your boundaries didn't get respected once. So why would they get respected a second time? Is there a way to stay resilient um, in setting those boundaries? So I think the problem is, is that people assume that the first time a boundary is set, that it, that it should be automatically met, especially with people that are habitual line steppers, right? The people that can consistently step over the line. And the problem is, is that somebody will set a boundary, you know, they'll say, Saxon, if you keep talking to her that, that way, I'll leave. And so Saxon says something and then it's like, yeah, I tried to set a boundary and it didn't work. You have to keep setting it. Mm -hmm. Right. Just think about like a little kid who, hey, no, you can't touch the outlet. You can't touch the outlet. And you have to be prepared to keep saying your boundary. And that like that's the key is that some people will try and wear your boundary down. And you also also have to think about the people you interact with are those people that you want to interact with if they consistently try and push your boundaries. Because that's another thing. It's not just setting the boundary. It's really the people that respect it or the people who don't. And you have to be able to think about that. Like, hey, Saxon, I've told you, you know, I don't know, 20 times, please do not call me after 10 p.m. The, it will wake up the baby. Please do not call me. And you said, you know, if you call me, I will not answer. And I will, I will keep not answering. So please do not call me after 9 or 10. And so the thing about it is, is that you have to be able to understand that the boundary is what you're going to do not what someone else is going to do versus mm -hmm. saying Saxon stop cussing at me that's not a boundary a boundary is Saxon if you keep cussing at me I will not be having this conversation so it's really what you're going to do and I think that's where kind of the boundary part is misunderstood it's what are you going to do if the boundary is broken not what the other person is doing and so thinking about that like I had a friend who um, was going to go watch her brother play basketball and the other friend that was going to go with her was like 30 minutes late. It was, I was like, holy crap. And I said, well, why don't you go leave and go to the bat to the basketball game? And she was like, well, well, he's on his way. He's on his way. And I was like, but you, you want to go. I know, but he's on his way. And so a boundary for her would have been, if you don't show up by this time, I'm leaving. I understand you're on your way, but we agreed on this time. I can give you a five minute buffer, but if you're this late, I will be leaving and you leave. Because what I tend to see is people will put another person being on their way instead of them just going. And that on the way overrides them wanting to go do the thing. And I was like, but you're going to miss like 30 minutes of your brother playing. I know, but he's on his way. Baby, I don't care if you're on your way from Africa. If we agreed on a time, I'm leaving because I'm more important with that. And sometimes people in that situation will be like, but they, but they drove to come and see you, but they were late. And they didn't respect my time, right? I like I get to have my time respected. That's a boundary. And so that's what one thing about it is that having that understanding of what boundaries are. What are you going to do? My boundary is not when you get here yelling and crying. My boundary is if you are late, I will leave. And then next time you get to decide, what do we do? Are you going to be on time? I have a best friend who is habitually late. Like when I say late, late with a capital cursive L like he will be two hours late to a brunch like he is the one that you know he's gonna be late and we had these dinner reservations that were a time like it's like 90 minutes even. and he was like 30 minutes late and I told him I said Marlon if you're going to be late like that again I will not invite you I'm not saying we won't hang out but I will not invite you if you're gonna be that late like we can't enjoy it and ever since then he's on, he's on time to that at least anything else he's late but that he's on time and so it's hard when people bounce up about your, against your boundaries, it's difficult to set them when maybe you're first starting and you're gathering your words of what do I say? How do I do this? But understanding that everyone's learning in that moment. And someone can say, well, you didn't, you know, you didn't care I was late last time. You're right, I didn't, but now it's important. And you're able to talk about it because I think sometimes someone will be like, well, that didn't matter. No, you can be honest and say, you're right. I didn't care that time, but this time I do. And I, I want you to be early so that we can go to this together. But if you don't, I'm not, I'm not going to wait for you. Yeah, like loyalty to someone doesn't necessarily mean it should override your own personal boundaries. That, yes. 
a hundred percent still have friends and be respectful of their needs too but you shouldn't yeah. also be sacrificing your own boundaries your own morals your own crossing your own lines yes. for someone else and sex is but the problem is, is that's what we're taught as women that we sacrifice yeah. everything for everyone else and if you don't you're in the wrong what you didn't wait for john he was on the way I know, he, and it'll be like, I know he was 50 minutes late, but he was on the way. What? Like, and, and, and like people will acknowledge, like, I know he did all these bad things. I know she did all these bad things, but they were on the way. But, right, all these buts to make it your fault. And it's like, no, I'm not, like, I'm not taking that. You can butt some No, no I mean, as... A female in my early 20s, I see, I hear all the excuses. I do. I hear all the excuses of why you should still be doing this for that person or why this person deserves a second chance. And it's understanding, you know, and that's, you know, why I'm so happy to be participating you know, in this conversation because it's something that the earlier you learn, the easier it gets to, you mm -hmm. know, stand your ground um, yeah. in different settings as well, not just with your peers. Um, we did also get a follow up from um, Janet in that um, in our comments. Um, she asked, "Is it easier to teach advocacy in the moment, or are there certain skills that kid that can help kids learn to be advocates for themselves?" Yeah, that's a good question. So I think the first thing is is getting the, the kids to use their words. And so what I mean by that is if if an athlete wants to do something, they'll be like, "I'm fine, I'm fine." we're not doing that. Like we're not, I want you to use your words. What is it you need? And we don't allow them to be passive aggressive. Oh, I just wish, no, what, are, what is it you need? When you tell me what you need, we can talk about it and getting them to use their words because a lot of kids are coming from very passive aggressive households where that's all they see role models. So they literally don't know how to verbalize. This is, this is what I want. This is what I need. And so we have to help them with that. So sometimes you can talk about it right beforehand, but then a lot of the good, good learning is in the moment when they're sitting there mad, fine. It's like, I understand you're mad. And this is what a great opportunity for you to advocate for what you want. Understanding that sometimes you're not going to get it, but it still is what you should do. Well, why? I'm not going to get what I want because it teaches you how to keep self-advocating. And so you're able to have kind of these two different conversations, one beforehand of helping them figure out their words of what they need, but also in the moment. Yeah, I understand you're mad, but crying is not going to get the way. But you also have to remember that maybe in their household, all they've seen is their mom cry to get the way. So it's like you're kind of going to, you're grappling again against what they're seeing in their house, what works, and trying to, you're trying to retrain them for another way. So remember, you have to think about that, that you're helping retrain their brain with that type of thing. And we did get another question from Stacy, and I really, really like this one, especially thinking in terms of athlete and coach. But Stacy asked, how do you maintain these boundaries when there's a power imbalance in the relationship? Oh my gosh, that's such a good one. When we think about like a boss that maybe wants you to stay late and you can't. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, the first thing is like thinking about this aspect of what is, um, like what, what are the consequences? What are they actually? And what are the ones that I'm imagining? Because sometimes we imagine these consequences that really aren't existing. And so sometimes we're like, well, I don't want to say anything because what if and our mind spins? And it's like, is that actually real? Is it maybe trauma from another experience? Or is it something that like, I need to really consider in this situation? And I think sometimes it's having the conversation. Hey coach, I understand you want me to stay late but I already have plans. So in the future, if I would love to stay late, then in the future, I, I just tell me beforehand and I can make it happen. But right now, last minute, I have to go pick up my kid. I have, I, whatever it is, I want to go just lay on my couch and watch TV, right? Like being able to vocalize that and understand you might get some pushback or you might get the, okay. But we have to have the opportunity. And also while we're recognizing that power imbalance, know that it's real. And a lot of times people in leadership don't even think about it when they're making these requests. And so keep it in your mind, but also, like I said, it's, hey, I, I would love to do that, but I just can't right now. Or, hey, thank you for telling me, but I, can't, I have to leave every day at five o'clock. I, I have to go drive or do whatever. I just have to leave. 
and knowing that sometimes the consequences are a lot bigger and are kind of we've made up and actually can happen. Not saying that there won't be consequences. Sometimes there might be. And you have to think about that situation. Is that one you want to be in? Is it worth setting the boundary? Like those are all things to think about. None of this stuff is black and white. There's a lot of gray to it. But how, how do we think about the gray in just a different way? I love that. And talking about, again, that relationship between coaches and athletes, what are some proactive steps that coaches can take to help create a team culture that values some of those things like respect and open communication and conflict resolution? So I think the first thing is what I tend to see with a lot of coaches in their team values is that they have those words, but they haven't fleshed them out. And so when you say open communication, like what does that mean? So if I have a team value of open communication, but I've never actually communicated what it means, well, I'm already causing some issues. And so thinking about as you're being proactive, when we talk about open communication, that means that if we're disagreeing with someone, we're talking to them face to face. We're not sending text messages. Yes, I understand that you might need to talk over with your teammate, but that's not where it should end. If there's a concern, we're talking about with our teammates, right? We're, we're being specific. When we say respect, what do we mean by respect? So everyone's on the same page. Because some people will like to do um, like those word games, semantics. Well, respect to me means, and it's like, no, it doesn't. You're trying to like play these semantical games. Stop it, right? Like, and so we have to think about like what, like, and everyone agrees when we talk about respect, this is what we mean so that people have an actual understanding. When we talk about we are going to give each other feedback, what does that mean? When we say we're going to get, we're going to be open for feedback, what does that mean? And we're having actual conversations on the nuance of the word so we can come to a better agreement of, as to what we all mean. Because when you are proactively just setting values and no one has talked about it, it's not going to, right? It, it, it's going to come up where people are thinking the word means a different thing. I think also when we talk about being proactive is talking that conflict is going to happen. Conflict is going to happen when you win, when you lose. It's going to happen with your teammate who you love, your teammate that you hate. It's going to happen with your coaching staff. You, I'm not going to like you. You're not going to like me. Like conflict's going to happen a lot. When we get to hard times, we're going to see people bickering with each other. Like we have to understand conflict, especially when you're you're passionate, you're going for winning. It's going to happen. And the question though is, is that how do we interact when it does happen? How am I interacting with you? Am I yelling, screaming, crying, cussing? Or am I sitting here talking to you and we're able to center the relationship to fix it? Because I think many times what happens is that people aren't used to centering the relationship. I know I wasn't in the past. It was like, I need to prove to you that you're wrong, I'm right. And the reality is, is that the relationship loses and we don't want the relationship to lose. And so, I come from that idea of like, these people mean a lot. Yeah, I'll be upset, but what space do I need to be in to talk about it? And so talking through those things proactively with your team versus something happens and now we're setting all these rules that no one's going to pay attention to because they're all mad. How do we proactively get people to understand the feelings, the emotions, the things that are going to occur throughout the season before it happens so people are prepared when it does happen? We do that with practice, right? We practice random things. Well, if, you know, there's two seconds left on the clock and the ball's at half court. Like we do all that stuff. It's, it's fifth set, scores 15, 15. We have to switch blocks, but we don't do that with conflict. Well, we should do the same thing because the conflict will blow up your team worse than losing games. And I think all of that is so valid and like so just on the spot. And I think coaches just a lot of times, and I applaud all the coaches who are on here and taking the time to, you know, better themselves mm -hmm. for their athletes. Um, but do you think there's certain skills or areas where you think coaches don't get enough training for and like there's areas that they aren't equipped in to be able to handle stuff like this or conversations with their athletes in this manner? hundred percent. I think the first one is that emotional regulation. Us as coaches, we're not taught emotional regulation at all. We're not taught to have the conversation about emotional regulation. We're not taught what it looks like, right? Uh, I see that a lot of the role models for great coaching, you know, we think about Kim Mulkey, Pat Summit, all these coaches are throwing their jackets, breaking clipboards, like all of that just intense passion is looked at as being positive. But the reality of it, I think about what does it look like for a coach at the hardest moment to keep their emotions in check? 
What does it look like when you're disappointed? It's you're losing by 30 in the championship game, which you should have crushed them, right? Whatever it is, the, the hardest, hurt, angriest moment that you're met, you're able to keep your emotions. I think about when I was at Illinois and we're, we're playing UCLA and we're losing and Kevin Hamburg is now at Stanford. Like he was so emotionally regulated. You would have never thought what was happening was happening. It's not saying he wasn't passionate. He wasn't upset, but he was able to keep his emotions because I don't think how many coaches understand how directly their emotions affect their athletes, directly affect it. I think about the coaches who are really quiet, but then feel like they need to do something so that they get carded, they scream and yell. The reality of that is you are not helping your athletes positively. They are now sitting there shocked that their coach is acting in this very abnormal way. And now they feel like it's their responsibility to calm their coach down and that should never be happening. And I say this as a 27-year-old head coach that literally was carded. I'm probably in the card hall of fame in volleyball. The amount your girl was carded. And I always said the thing of like, you don't, you, you don't get to yell at the coaches or at the athletes. Or excuse me, you don't get to yell at the refs. I do. And it's like, why? Just because I'm in power? So now what I'm doing is I'm showing them that because I'm in power, I get to say whatever I want. And that's just not the way it goes, right? We have to, as coaches be better with our emotions and understand the direct correlation of how our emotions are and how they are affecting our athletes, good, bad, or otherwise, which is why as I got older, I tried to have less emotion. It's not saying I was cheering or passion, but I wasn't having my athletes ride this with me, right? I would kind of sit there. I'd call my timeout, but, and I always wondered like Russ Rose, who coached at Penn State, that man never left sitting. He would sit there, he'd have his notebook and I would be like, why isn't he yelling and screaming? Because the athletes are doing the work, right? The athletes are the ones that are, they, they need to understand how to manage their emotion and play off of it and not play off of your emotion. Because when you can always tell when a coach is high and the coach, the athletes are high, when the coach drops, the athletes go in. And so I would say emotional regulation is, you know, one of the big things. Um, I would say the next thing is, how to have tough conversations that are very specific. And what I mean by that is whenever an, a coach has to have a tough conversation, because they're worried about the athlete's emotions, they try and like just do everything to massage it versus saying, right, the, the way you're playing right now, your passing is not this, right? We have to get your hitting up, being very specific and said, well, and they just kind of beat around the bush for saying, these are the specific things that you need to work on. These are the specific things that concern me and being very specific with it because when you try and massage stuff, people don't get what you're really saying and they're leaving vague. And if an athlete's leaving vague of what is needed from them, that's just going to cause more issues. So I think those would be, would be the biggest thing. Awesome. And Sue Ellen, I think she had a question about um, something you talked on with conflict drills. Could you elaborate on an example of what a, one of these drills might look like and how coaches can implement them in their practices? Yeah. I mean, I think it's what would be a drill, like she said, that's high, high emotion that would have your athletes start picking at each other. Like what type of drill would that be? And it can depend on your whatever sport it is. What would it be where it gets to a certain point and they start to say those snide comments? I think about like a drill if maybe we're, we're getting 10 in and an athlete keeps missing on the eighth serve. Oh, Jen, can you just get over? Oh. All right, like, like how do we start seeing those, those times where there can be high conflict that we can start talking about what's occurring in that situation or situations where you know that eventually it's going to be maybe someone's forgetting the balls. Maybe someone's not doing the thing that they should be. Those are things that, okay, those are going to be when it happens. How do we talk about this? How do we say who needs to do that, right? Like, okay, we know the first years have to get the ball. And they leave them again. Instead of it being, oh, first years, you need to get the ball. Instead, it could be like, hey, this is your responsibility. Can you all please set up a plan of who's going to get it? the balls each day and we're being more specific versus oh, oh god first year you all keep bringing the balls and then like start like doing that like nipping no instead 
you, this is your responsibility. We have helped you, but you all need to have a plan of how you're going to manage it because that's the stuff that gets small C to big C conflict, right? The people keep forgetting the ball, keep forgetting it. No one really addresses it. They like kind of whine, but no one addresses it. And then it gets to be worse and worse. And so how can we, those small things, do we start talking about before they become big things? Awesome. And I think we have time for two more questions I want to get to. And one of the second to last ones was how can coaches involve parents in supporting their daughters and developing essentialized skills like setting boundaries and managing conflict? Um, a lot of the things we talked about today. I think it's having a meeting at the beginning of season and the meeting, not just talking about um, this is what the schedule is going to be, but like, no, your kid might not play the time they want, the position they want. They might not. And it's going to be really hard for them. And they're going to come home crying. They're going to do all this. My hope is that you're not going to immediately call me and why is my kid you know, doing all this, that you're going to take a step back and talk to them. Because I remember when I would do that, my mom would be like, have you talked to the coach? No. Okay, well, talk to the coach, right? And a lot of times it's the parents want to step over. Well, you know, because I'm in this volleyball mom group. And the amount of moms that want to jump over the kids to go talk to the parent to go, to go talk to the coaches is unacceptable. And we had that's a training. And to tell the, the parent, I understand you were going to be worried about your child. It makes sense. But this is how we have the interaction. Your athlete comes and talks to me. If they don't like that, then we'll schedule a, a conversation with the athlete and the parent. Because what happens is that many times the kid is saying 10% of what's really going on. The, the parent takes the 10% of 100%, jumps over to talk to the coach. And then it's like, oh, I didn't know that. Oh, oh, oh. And so it's really get, like having the parents understand you are, there are going to be times where you are so mad that your little Jimmy did not come, did not play. And you're going to want to come and march up to me after the game. Please do not do that. Like acknowledging the emotions and saying, do not do that. I will not talk to you. 100%. Because they, it, it is Betty Ann. It's actually a partnership. We are all working together and you cannot take what your kid is saying is 100% the truth because they are leaving stuff out and having that honest conversation because you, this is setting them up to be able to advocate for themselves. You don't want to be the 22 year old that your mom's calling your job for you, but that's what's happening because parents want to protect their kids from everything. Their kid not playing is a part of life. I understand your kid is all American, but sometimes they're not going to play. And it's okay. That's how you learn growth. That's how you learn to work hard. That's how you learn to figure out your role. All those things are happening. And I think a part of it is unfortunate is the amount of money that parents are having to put out. So their thought is like, well, because I'm paying so much, we are do this. And it's not true. It, you, you can only have a volleyball of six people on the court. And we have 10 people who pay. And so I think it's really important that parents or that coaches, you have this kind of stuff that you talk about beforehand. And it involves really the emotions, the feelings, the communication, all of that stuff. And, and Nick saying it, you will want to come to talk to me because your kid's not playing. Like you will want to do that. I, one of my friends real quick, he, it was at the beginning of high school. And he was like, can I, can I show you this letter I'm going to send to the coach? I said, you better not send it to him. Well, let me read it to you do not and he's reading it. I was like no don't, do not send this no 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 well I mean you know do, don't send it because part of it was like I hope the trials are fair and I'm like so what you're alluding to is that the trials have been unfair in the past because your kid hasn't made varsity no I'm not and so parents will put these uh, you right alluding in I didn't say it but you're alluding to it which is even worse there should be no communication like that from a parent because it's evident what's happening you want your kid to play and you can say you don't, but it's very obvious. And it already starts to break the coach-parent relationship. And to tell them, please do not email me about playing time. Please do not. Because I asked my friend Sean, I said, how much have you went and watched her practice? And he was like, well, I watched the end and she's just standing around. I said, so you're, why is it your daughter shagging balls, handing balls, tossing balls? Oh, I didn't think about that. Exactly. So those are all things that she should be doing. If you're saying she's standing around for 20 minutes, that's her fault. He was like, I didn't really think about that. Exactly. What is it your daughter, your son, whoever it needs to do is a key component of these conversations. 
Yeah, no, that's, that's a great point. And I, I like how all the support from coaches in the, in the comments right now, mm -hmm. loving the fact athletes talking to coaches first. And I think that's great. Yeah. Um, we are coming up on time. So I want to give you a chance to, I know we talked about a lot of really important stuff today, but mm -hmm. what's the one key takeaway that you want these coaches to take to help support their female athletes or what's a message that they can relate to their female athletes to help stand up for them. But what is, what is that takeaway for you, you think, for these coaches? To really tell them it's okay if people are mad and it's okay if people think you're a bit. It's okay, right? Like it's, it's okay if people are going to be mad at you because you're making decisions that protect yourself. It is so okay. And you will find the people that are supporting you with that because when I hear a lot of people, women who are like, well, if I say no, they're not going to be my friend or whatever it is. The reality of it is that you don't want people whose sole goal is to push over your boundaries and to use you and to tell your athletes that. I understand you feel like, yes, Pam, doing the right thing is hard. I understand you can feel like you're going to lose your friends, but it's not friends if their whole goal is just to use you. Like, it's not. And to really get them to understand that, that it's okay if people are like, you keep saying no, she's such a bitch. Okay, I'm going to sleep well tonight because I know I'm protecting myself and keeping myself out of trouble. I see too many young women who put themselves in very, very dangerous places because they want people to like them. So dangerous. And they could be, it, it could be stopped if they were able to say, no, it feels uncomfortable, I'm leaving. And that's why I want them to say, it's okay if people are upset. It's okay if the person that you really like thinks you're, you're dumb for wanting to leave. It's so okay because you're putting yourself out harm's way and that's what matters. That's awesome. Thank you so much. And I, I just want to thank both you coaches and we coach for all helping to support today's conversation. Um, I think this is a really, really important conversation that more, you know, young women need to hear um, to not only advance their, you know, athletic careers now, but then transition that into the professional world later and just, you know, mm -hmm. life itself. But um, Marcy, I'm also going to pull you back um, into the mix of things, I just want to give you a shout out and we coach for all the work you do um, to help power girls forward in your communities as well. Um, so if you have any last words, feel free to jump in, but just tons of thank yous, Dr. Jen Fry, for being here and taking your time to lead this conversation with me. Um, it was yeah. fabulous. Thank you, Saxon. You did great with the questions. I appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, you guys were a dynamic duo. It was a lot of fun to be a participant on this side of it and high fives all around to everybody, all the coaches, administrators in the room who took time out for you because this was important for you to be in the room. There is an absolute reason that you were here and that you chose this session. So we're excited to be a part of this and thank you BSN Sports for letting us be a part. Appreciate it. Awesome. Thank you all for sticking around. Um, and then we will coordinate with some of those prizes. Um, Marcy, will Yay. be reaching out to you guys. So thank you all for a really engaged conversation. Um, and we will be sending out this recording. So if you have anyone else you would like to share and loop into this conversation, um, you will have that recording at your disposal um, sometime within the week. So um, keep an eye out on your emails and we'll get to the back to you guys shortly. But Thank you all very much for participating today and we'll, we hope to talk to you soon. Bye friends. Bye all.